Hi everyone. Good day to you, wherever you are. And I welcome you to the finest music drama channel. Sharing the love of finest literature. Just lie down on an easy chair. Throw your cares off your mind. Think of nothing but the temperature of your drink. I hope you will enjoy today's dramatization. Your comments are much appreciated. Please support the love of finest literature by subscribing and sharing the channel with friends to get updated on future releases. I will make a short introduction to A House to Let, a short story by Charles Dickens, Wilkie Collins, Elizabeth Gaskell and Adelaide Ann Proctor. It was originally published in 1858 in the Christmas edition of Dickens' Household Words magazine. Each of the contributors wrote a chapter and the story was edited by Dickens. A House to Let was the first collaboration between the four writers, although Collins and Dickens had worked with Proctor on previous Christmas stories for the magazine in 1854, 1855, and 1856. The four authors would write together again in 1859's The Haunted House which appeared in the extra Christmas number of All the Year Round, the successor to Household Words which Dickens had started after a dispute with his publishers. In a letter to Collins from the 6th of September 1858, Dickens outlined his idea for a Christmas story. He originally envisioned the story being written by himself and Collins with his plot outline fleshed out by Collins, but was later to invite Gaskell and Proctor to contribute chapters. Dickens and Collins wrote the first chapter, Over the Way, and the last chapter let at last together, and each of the writers wrote one of the intervening chapters, Gaskell the Manchester Marriage, Dickens going into society. Proctor Three Evenings in the House and Collins Trottle's Report. The plot concerns an elderly woman, Sophanisba, who notices signs of life in a supposedly empty dilapidated house, the eponymous house to let, opposite her own and employs the efforts of an elderly admirer, Jabez Jabba, and her servant, Trottle, to discover what is happening within. Charles Dickens is one of England's most important literary figures. His works enjoyed enormous success in his day and are still among the most popular and widely read classics of all time. Let listen to the dramatization. The events occurred a little before Christmas. I was unmarried and I was childless, which was a greater regret. I'd been living at Tunbridge Wells, and when I complained that I was feeling a little less than lively, my doctor, who I think was tired of seeing me, declared that what I needed was a change of scene, and that a move to London might be the answer. I pondered his suggestion, and at last I summoned my manservant, his name is Trottle, and sent him off to see if he could find a place in town where I might be happy enough to lay my troublesome old head. After two days, he returned. I've uh, found somewhere for you, ma'am. Oh, excellent. It's quite charming. Oh, splendid. You can take it for six months and then extend the lease if you so desire. Perfect. Perfect indeed. There's not a fault in the entire property. Oh. The fault lies outside it. Yes, the house in question is situated opposite another house. A common occurrence, Trottle, in the great metropolis. True, ma'am, but uh, this other house, which is a house to let, is a dull and dingy house, in need of much repair. Ah. Well, perhaps it'll be let quite soon, and it'll take on a brighter appearance. I don't think so, ma'am. The house, it seems, won't let. It never does. I journeyed to London. I viewed the place which Trottle had found for me and decided it was very fine. I decided, too, that the house over the way was, in truth, an eyesore. But that all in all, when one set the good points against the bad, the good one, as I like to think it often does. Just a week or so prior to Christmas, I moved my old bones, along with bags and baggage, into my new accommodation. 
I settled myself into a chair by the drawing room window. Oh. Oh, yes. And I gazed through the window and I told myself that I was contented enough. But that events somehow had not gone quite right in my life and what was missing from it was a dear child whom I could love. And then all of a sudden, as I looked out at the house over the way, <laughs> I threw myself back and my limbs felt as if electricity had shot right through them. Good heavens. Good heavens. <laughs> Before my tale progresses any further, I ought to confess that I have an unusual Christian name. Zofanitzba. The name justifiably has grown out of fashion. It is particularly absurd when on the lips of Mr. Jabez Jabba. Sophie Nisba, my <laughs> dear, Sophie Nisba. But then, in all fairness, Mr. Jabba himself is somewhat absurd. A perfumed, prettily dressed fellow with a little smile and little legs and little roundabout ways. An admirer of mine who had proposed on numerous occasions. So, Finnisper, <laughs> welcome to London. How are you, my dear? Oh, infirm as ever. Nonsense. Well, I am distressed at any rate. Distressed by what? By that house, the one over the way. And how exactly does that house distress you, so Finnisper, dear? Well, you'll think it very foolish. You'll think I'm a silly old woman with a fevered brain. Never, never. Go to the window, Mr. Jarber, and tell me what you see. Hmm. I see a dirty, dilapidated building, rusty railings, several shattered panes of glass. The steps leading to the door are broken. Oh, and on the door, some child has attempted a drawing in chalk. It's meant, I think, to be a ghost. Ah, perhaps it's the ghost that has yeah, perturbed you. No, Mr. Jarber, it is not. What can you see at the first floor window? The first floor? On the right. Well, there's a blind. Yes, and what about the blind? It has a hole in it. It does. This morning, Mr. Jarber, when I looked across at that window, at that hole in the blind, I found I was looking at an eye. An eye? Whose eye? Well, I have no idea whose eye. Well, it's not there now, Sophonis. <laughs> I'm glad. Why, may I ask, are you upset about this eye? I am upset, Mr. Jarba, because I have been informed there is no one living in that house. It has been unoccupied for a great many years. There ought not, therefore, to have been an eye at the first floor window. Sophie Nisper, Sophie Nisper, only one explanation can suffice. A spirit haunts that house. A spirit with a malevolent eye. <laughs> a somewhat hasty and over-imaginative conclusion, I feel. Well, the house is haunting my spirit. I'm certain of that. Still, when I speak with Trottle... Trottle? Oh, yes, I remember Trottle. He stayed behind at Tunbridge Wells to make sure that all is in order there, but he'll arrive on Saturday and he'll tell me, no doubt, that I'm being ridiculous and he'll calm my anxious state. Perhaps he will. But Jabba is here, here and now, and Jabba can discover the truth. Oh, uh... Jabba has connections. He dines with house agents and tax officers and church wardens. He is intimate at the circulating library. Why shouldn't Jabba set about investigating the house over the way and do so immediately? Uh, for this reason, the Jabba is as infirm as I am. Oh. There were all that toing and froing. You might catch cold. Sophie Nisper, my dear, I've suffered worse for you. Oh. Whatever extraordinary secret is contained within the walls of that house, Jabez Jabba will reveal it. Oh. I thought of little else but the house to let. I kept a watch on it. I dreamt of it. And when Trottle arrived, I spoke to him not of domestic arrangements, but of the eye at the window, and of Mr. Jarber's avowed intention to solve the mystery. Mr. Jarber? Uh, huh. What good is he? Well, he has some uses, I'm sure. He'll not get very far with a problem of this nature, ma'am. I can assure well, you of that. We shall see, Trottle. We shall see. He's to return here tomorrow and he will give us the result of his investigations. Hmm. The morrow came, and so did Mr. Jarber. Good evening, my dear no. Sophonisba. Oh, and Trottle too. Evening, Mr. Jarber. These pleasantries over, I poured Mr. Jarber a cup of tea, and he brought out from underneath his cloak a roll of papers. Behold! Oh. 
and he waved the roll triumphantly in the direction of the house over the way and then spread the papers out upon the table. Trottle, meanwhile, began to move towards the door. Uh, I have made some very interesting discoveries. Mr. Java, I'm overwhelmed. Trottle. Yes, ma'am? Sit and listen and learn. Yes, ma'am? First, would you be very much surprised, my dear Sophonisba, if the house in question turned out to be the property of one who is related to you? Yes, Mr. Jarper, I would. It is owned by Mr. George Forley. Forley? A cousin of yours, I believe. Yes. He is, I gather, unwell at present. Is he? I hadn't heard. I hold no communication with him. He's an unpleasant man. Fell out with one of his daughters because he disapproved of her marriage. My daughter's child died, poor thing, and he showed no pity. Well, now that I think about it, Mr. Jarber, I am not so very much surprised that my cousin owns that house. It accounts for the grim appearance of the place and its ability to upset me so. Is Mr. Forney mentioned in those sheets of paper? No, no, not at all. I'm glad. So, let us hear what you have uncovered. Trottle, you are rather far away from us. Yes, ma'am. Why are you mortifying yourself in those Arctic regions? Come and join us round the fire. I'm happy over here, thank you, ma'am. As you wish. Go ahead, Mr. Jarper. The very first occupants of the house were a man and his wife from Manchester. The wife, Alice, was a pretty, gentle, pliant creature who had been married before uh, to a young man named Frank Wilson. This Frank had sailed to the East Indies and had never returned, and with no news of the ship or any of the crew, he was presumed to have perished. There was a child by this first marriage, though the father never saw it, a weak, sickly thing it was, and in order to provide for herself and the child, Alice had let her house out to lodgers. One of these lodgers was Mr. Openshaw, a bluff, self-taught businessman, who had found that despite himself he felt a tenderness towards Alice's frail child, which soon extended towards Alice herself. Mrs. Wilson. Yes, sir? I'm wondering, what do you think? Is there any reason, do you suppose, why we two shouldn't, as it were, put up our horses together? I'm not sure I understand what you mean, sir. Well, to be a little plainer, will you have me to be thy wedded husband for richer and poorer? Richer, I can assure you, and all that sort of thing. Hmm? What'd you say? Sir, forgive me, but this is all rather unexpected and I need some time to think the matter over. Three minutes? Three minutes? But I'd sooner not wait that long. I've a lot of office work to get through tonight, so be a sensible woman and say yes without delay. She said yes. Oh. Not quite without delay, but she found it hard to resist Mr Openshaw's strong will and the promise he held of comfortable circumstances as well as the affection he showed towards her daughter. They married. Mr Openshaw prospered and they moved from Manchester to London. To the house over the way. To the house over the way. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, but does this story have a point? Of course it has a point. Wait, listen, Trottle. Now I'm sure you'll be enlightened. <sighs> With the Openshaws came Nora, who had been in Alice's service since the time of the first marriage, and who was devoted both to Alice and to the child. Between her and Mr Openshaw, however, relations were very far from cordial, for each of them was unable to detect the other's good qualities. The events of one particular evening brought the situation to a crisis. <coughs> Yes. Good evening to you, Nora. May I come in? How do you know my name? Who are you? Dear Nora, I can't have changed that much. In truth, Frank Wilson had changed a great deal over the years. But as Nora gazed at him, there was no mistaking those bright blue eyes of his. Just a little while before, Nora had been looking down at a young girl's bright blue eyes till they had closed in sleep. Oh, heavens! Oh, good Lord! I could find no trace of Alice, so I searched for you, Nora. It took a while to find you, but I've succeeded at last. And now, you must tell me and tell me straight. 
What has happened to my wife? She's still alive, is she not? Tell me, please. If she's dead, then I shall try to endure it, but I must know... She's not dead. Oh, thank God, thank God. Where is she, Nora? Did she get any of my letters? No, she never got your letters, sir. Nothing was heard of you. Nothing at all. She thought... She, she... thought I'd died. Yes. You can't blame her, sir, surely. Has she married again? She has. Oh, God. And she is content and happy. Oh, no, Nora. Be good to me. Be honest with me. And tell me where I might find her. Are you still in the service? Is she living here? Well, mercy me. A tragic situation, was it not? Yes. The unfortunate Nora felt such pity for this man. And yet she was terrified of the effect on her mistress if she discovered that Frank Wilson was alive. Poor Nora. Poor Frank. Poor Trottle. May I leave now, Mum? Leave? How can you think of leaving? Another cup of tea, Mr Jarber. Or something stronger, perhaps, for both of us. This tale, I fear, won't have a happy ending. Shortly before Christmas, I had moved to London and had found myself in a state of anxiety on account of the house over the way. The house was dilapidated, it was unoccupied, so I had been told. And yet I was certain I had seen an eye peering out from one of the windows. Mr Jarber, a long-standing admirer of mine, had promised to discover the mystery of the house to let. To the annoyance of my manservant Trottle, who was no admirer of Mr Jarber, and he had uncovered a story relating to the first occupants of the house. So, picture the scene. Alice Openshaw's devoted servant Laura, confronted by her mistress's first husband Frank, who had been supposed by everyone to have died at sea. Oh, um, no. uh, Trottle, forgive me, Mr. Jarber. Trottle, are you being polite? Uh, with respect, ma'am, I have become a little doubtful as to the usefulness of this tale. Well, perhaps you have, but you will do, Mr Jarber, the courtesy of hearing him out. Continue, Mr Jarber. Thank you, my dear. Now, I should tell you that Alice herself was not in the house when Frank's unfortunate visit occurred. Uh, she and Mr Openshaw were in Richmond with friends, and Nora, whose fierce desire was to protect Alice from pain and distress, was desperate to ensure that Frank was gone before the Openshaws returned. At the same time, she felt deep sorrow and pity for the man who stood before her. There is one thing I ought to tell you, sir. Well? You have a child. <gasps> Nora? She's a frail, pathetic thing, but she's loved. And life gives her pleasure despite her illness. Is the child here? May I see her? She's asleep upstairs. Listen. After you've seen her, you must leave immediately. If you were to make yourself known to my mistress, she'd be unable to endure it. You promise you will leave? I promise. If you like, I'll arrange to meet you tomorrow. Very well. And in the meantime, I'll, well, I'll try and think what can be done. This way. The servant took Frank into the nursery, and he bent over the cot and with wistful eyes gazed upon his daughter. Sweet little thing. Sweet, dear child. What is her name? Elsie. Elsie? <laughs> Let me hold her. Oh, no, no, no. She mustn't be walking. Dearest Elsie. <laughs> Am I never to see you again? <laughs> it seemed to the anxious Nora that it was a full half an hour before she managed to persuade Frank back downstairs. He told her the address of the hotel where he was staying, and then she ushered him out of the house. Shortly before eleven, Mr. and Mrs. Openshaw returned, 
and Nora, fearful and sick at heart, pretended that the evening had passed without incident and said nothing about the visitor. But Elsie had some words to say in the morning. Papa? Yes, Elsie? That man in the nursery last night, who was he? I think, dear child, that there wasn't a man in the nursery. There was a man perhaps in a dream you had? No, no. I woke up and I saw him. He was large and I was frightened of him, so I pretended I was still asleep. He was kneeling down and crying and he said his prayers. Listen to me, my dearest. Sometimes dreams can seem very real. No, I saw him. I did. Thomas. Alice, please. You must have a talk with this little lady of yours concerning dreams. You must tell her how vivid they can sometimes be. But it wasn't a dream. Thomas, have you seen my brooch? Your brooch? The one you gave me last Christmas. It was on the table in the hallway. My shawl was there too, and I meant to put it on yesterday evening before we went out, but I forgot. You haven't seen it? The loss of the brooch and Elsie's absolute insistence that a man had visited the nursery the previous night began to create some suspicion in Mr Openshaw's mind. Elsie was taken from the room and Nora was summoned. Nora? Yes, sir? Did someone visit here last night? Last night, sir? Yes. Someone who was not only admitted into the house but was even allowed to go into the nursery? The man was familiar to you, no doubt. An acquaintance. Oh, no, no, It was some fellow, I'm guessing, that you're sweet on and who imposed on you. No! You believed, I'm sure, that he was good and honest. At any rate, you had no reason to think that he was a thief. A thief? Last night, Nora, a brooch of mine went missing. Perhaps, indeed, other things have been stolen. Tell us the man's name. Nora, please. No, no. I am not finding fault with you, Nora. It's true that you and I haven't always got on, but Mrs Openshaw likes you and trusts you, and I want to trust you too. And I'm prepared to accept, therefore, that you were not privy to the theft of the brooch. I know nothing about the brooch. Exactly, but the man who was here last night, you know something about him. Tell me his name. No, sir. Nora. No, I can't. I won't. But I will tell you this, sir. I care more for your dear wife and her dear child than anyone ever cared for me. I devoted my life to looking after them. And it's sad. It's very sad if this is my reward. You're a harsh man, sir. You're a cursed man too, I'm sure of that. No good can ever come to you. She left the room and she put on her bonnet and shawl and rushed out of the house and though she had no notion of what could be done, she hurried towards the hotel where the unfortunate Frank was staying. I shan't go back. I shall never go back. I shall never see Elsie again or her mother. Even if I were not under suspicion, to be there in the house knowing the truth, knowing that sometime, sooner or later, my mistress must discover the truth herself. It's impossible. She never spoke with Frank. She was informed at the hotel that he had gone out some time earlier. She waited for him. Mr Openshaw, meanwhile, had gone to the police station and reported the theft of the brooch, and he was now returned. Oh, Thomas. Oh, I am so sorry. My dear, whatever is the matter? She'll never forgive me. I'll never forgive myself. Alice, please, what has happened? I found the brooch. Look, here. Where was it? It was attached to my shawl. Yesterday evening, when we went out, I picked the shawl up from the table, and as I did so, the brooch must have got caught in it. Oh, Thomas, I am so sorry. What on earth are we to do? Mr Openshaw, of course, went back to the police station in order to state that the brooch had been discovered, and also to seek any advice as to how best to make a search for Nora. But the police officer already had some information for Mr Openshaw. I have to tell you, sir, that a man's body has been found in the river. We think that he drowned himself, though we can't be certain. This piece of paper was in his pocket. The writing's hard to make out, but it looks like the address you gave me earlier. Yes. Yes, indeed. It seems possible to us, sir, that this fellow may be the one who visited your house last night. The dead man's pocket 
also contained a card bearing the name of a nearby hotel, and thus it was that Nora was found, and she was brought to the police station. She identified the body, describing Frank as an acquaintance of hers from many years before, and after this ordeal, Mr. Openshaw, who had waited for her, offered his hand to her and spoke to her gently. Why did he come to the house, Nora? Why did you let him go up to the nursery? Who was he, Nora? Tell me. Tell me the truth. His name was Frank Wilson. Wilson? Mrs. Openshaw's first husband. Oh, God. He had been shipwrecked. But he survived and got back to England. He'd no idea what had happened to his wife. But he found out where I was, and I told him the truth. Oh, but Sarah was so frightened. They wanted him out of the house as quickly as possible. He saw Elsie, though, before he left. Yes, yes. And I think, Sarah, I ought not to have let him. For it can only have made him feel more anguished still. And now the, the poor man lies dead and cold. Nora... You are not to blame, not in any way. Indeed, it is I who should be asking to be forgiven for doubting if you were honest. Oh, you won't tell Mrs. Openshaw, will you, sir? About Frank Wilson, I mean. No. I'll not tell her. It will remain a secret, Nora, between you and me. Now, if the police require nothing more of us, we should be getting home. The secret was kept. Nothing was said to Alice. Nothing was said to the child. Though, some years later, Alice died. And one morning, Mr. Openshaw took the girl to the cemetery in order to put flowers on Alice's grave. And not very far away, there was a grave marked F.W. And Mr. Openshaw led Elsie there and told her the truth at last and shed the only tears that she ever saw fall from his eyes. Well, a most moving tale. Thank you, Sovanispa. Thank you. Hmm. Mm. I am compelled to point out, uh, however... Yes, that, uh, Trottle. ...that as regards the mysterious nature of the house over the way, we are just as much in the dark as we were before the story began. Well, um... Yes, that is the case, is it not, Mr. Jarber? Far from it. Oh, the tale explains the oppressive pall of misery and morbidity which enshrouds that decaying edifice. It explains the curse that lies upon it. I venture to advise you, Sophonisper, that the eye which has stared out at you from the window opposite is not the eye of a mortal. It is a phantom eye. Huh. It belongs to Frank Wilson, who has returned to the house, seeking his wife and his daughter. This is Claptrap! Uh, trottle, please. Utter bunker! Forgive me, Trottle, the house is cursed. And if in your foolishness you need to be convinced of the fact, I have another remarkable tale to tell. Oh. Permit me, so Panispa, dear, to come here at the same time tomorrow, and I shall, I promise, amaze you with further revelations. Now then. If Mr. Jarber will persist with his senseless stories, then Trottle, it seems to me, is obliged to act of his own accord and deal with this matter as best he can. The house over the way is said to be unoccupied, and yet my mistress has seen an eye at the window. Would it not be a sensible plan, therefore, to go straight up to the house and knock upon the door and find out exactly who it is? Which mortal creature, I mean, who peers out through a hole in the blind? So, Trottle takes the initiative. Trottle goes straight up to the house. Phantom eyes indeed. Jabez Jarber is a ninny. A buffoon. That having been said, I have no notion at all as to what might await me inside this place. What if... What if the truth, when it reveals itself, should be more than Trottle's flesh and blood can bear? Well, Trottle, 
You have come this far. Will you knock upon the door? The house over the way contained a mystery. It was said to be unoccupied, and yet I had seen an eye peering out at me from one of the windows. Mr. Jarber, an acquaintance, well, no, admirer of mine, was certain that some ghostly activity provided the answer, but my sceptical manservant Trottle decided to search for a more rational explanation. A few days before Christmas, he walked across the street to the house to let. He knocked upon the door. He knocked a second time. At last, the door opened, and there stood an aged, lean, and wiry woman, and at her side a younger man who found it helpful to lean against the wall in order to steady himself. Oh, good evening, sir. And to you. Chilly weather, ain't it? Yes. Well, please come in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Slide the bolt, Benjamin. Slide the bolt, right. We was expecting you, sir. <laughs> you were? Oh yes. Oh yes. Mr. Forley. Mr. Forley. That's right. He wrote us a letter. That's right. Oh. The twentieth of the month, he said you might be coming in the evening, <laughs> and here you are, ain't you, sir? Mr. Forley's particular associate on the twentieth. In the evening, that's right. Uh, we, we, we'll go into the dining room, shall we, sir? Mm. I've a candle burning there. Oh. Nice, clean room, as you see, sir. We keep it clean, don't we, Benjamin? Clean, that's right. In readiness, you know, for when Mr Forley comes to visit. <laughs> How is he faring? How is he faring? Um... We were sorry to hear he hadn't been too well. He hasn't, that's true. You'll wish him good health when you see him next, won't you, sir? Certainly, certainly. <laughs> My son's not too well himself. Your son? Benjamin here. Indigestion he has, the poor dear. Indigestion, that's what it is. By the way, sir, I don't suppose you and I have ever met, have we? You? Me? No. Your face is strangely familiar. Oh. Anyways, um... Yes? <laughs> shall we commence our little bit of business? Hmm? Shall we, sir? I had no notion that Tottle was engaged upon his adventure over the way. That very evening, Mr Jarber called again with a further instalment of his revelations about the house to let, and I had intended that Trottle should join us. But Trottle, of course, was not to be found. Philandering somewhere, oh. that's what he's up to. Philandering? Oh. oh, I hope not, Mr Jarber. I thought I'd cured him of that tendency when we were at Tunbridge Wells. Oh, do you remember, <laughs> Sophonisper, the last time I was with you at the Wells mm -hmm. and you and I danced the polka? Uh, no, Mr Jarber, you are wrong. We walked the polka. Oh. <laughs> now, what more is there to tell me about the house to let? Sophonisper, my dear, behold... As before, a roll of papers was extracted from beneath Mr. Jarber's fur-collared cloak, and as before, was waved in triumph. On my previous visit, Sophonisper, I brought you the sad tale of the first tenants of the house over the way. Mm -hmm. Now, I can reveal the identity of the very last person to rent that cursed abode. I have met with him and spoken with him. Where did you find him? Among the marshlands near Deadford. Marshlands? He was in his caravan. Mr. Maxman? That's me. 
You've nothing against the name, I hope. Who are you? Mr. Jabez Jabba. Oh. In a theatrical profession, are you? Uh, no, no. I am making an inquiry about a house. Well, this one's on wheels, sir. I'm very nicely decorated, as you see. Uh, uh, the, the house in question is one that I believe you rented some years ago. Ah, oh, the big house, you mean? Yes. I was wondering, Mr. Magsman, uh, if it might be compatible with your inclinations to tell me about your tenancy there and why you left the place. Well, now... I left it on account of the dwarf. The dwarf? The very same. And as to entering it, I did that a few years previous. I've been looking about for a good pitch, and I sees that house, and I says to myself, I'll have you, I will. And you did? Yeah. I made it a lovely thing, that house. Up the front, I put numerous canvases of the fat lady of Norfolk and the Indian savage with his tomahawk and a scalp oh. and the wild ass of the prairies. Yeah. Not that we ever had no wild asses. And lastly, there was a canvas representing the dwarf. A small canvas, that one. What, I wonder, did the neighbours think of all this? Well, they cut up rough about it, made complaints, which shook me, I must admit. A house of amusements right there on their very own street. What more do they want? Perhaps it was a question for respectability. Respectability? Well, if front submission ain't a respectable price, I don't know what is. Mm. And what about the dwarf? Oh, yes. The dwarf. Uncommon small he was. Not as small, of course, as he was made out to be, but then what dwarf ever is? Uh. <laughs> he was worth threepence on his own, in my view. Major Tupaschovsky of the Imperial Bulgradarian Brigade was his official title, but for reasons of convenience he became Chops. <laughs> yeah, such a kind man was Mr. Chops, and always falling in love with large women. Ooh. The fat lady of Norfolk, to give you a weighty example, though she chose to have a preference for the Indian savage. <laughs> Something else about him. Despite the fact that he never owned anything more than what he collected in his saucer, he was always thinking that he was entitled to property. <sighs> Come then, Toby Magsman. Turn the handle. Give us some music. To bring in the crowds, we'd have the barrel organ at the front of the house, and Mr Chops would sit on top of the organ. Grind away, Toby. Grind away. And with each turn of the handle, he'd become more and more excited. Oh, I can feel the vibration running through me. I can feel my property coming. I can feel the coins are jingling in me. I'm swelling out with money. Swelling out and swelling out till I'm as big as the Bank of England. Such is the influence of music, you see, on the poetic mind. The fact is, Toby Maxman, I don't much like this occupation of mine. And I don't much like the general public. This is often the case, I find, with human phenomenons what depend on the public for their living. Society is where I ought to be. Society. And when I get my fortune, that's where I'm going. Your fat lady, she isn't formed for society. Your Indian with his tomahawk most certainly isn't. But I am. I am. One afternoon, after Mr Chops had taken leave of his audience, three times round with the saucer and then retire from view, that was his custom, I was in the kitchen having serious conversations with the fat lady of Norfolk on account of her losing some bulkage during recent months. Help! When Mr Chops began shouting from the stairway. Help! Help! Throw a pail of water over me, quick! Mr Chops! What's happened? Oh, give me a brandy. Well, I ain't got no brandy. Well, then carry me to my bed. What the devil is the matter? The lottery. That's the matter. The lottery and a winning ticket. <gasps> oh. Toby Magsman, I have come into property at last. How much? £12,000. £12,000? <laughs> oh. I'm rich. You're that all right. I'm rich. And when I've recovered my senses, do you know what I'm going to do? You'll stand us all around, I hope. And after that... You'll be going into society. I shall, Toby Maxman. I shall. And he did. Well, to be truthful, he went mad for a week. And I had to make sure we kept him away from the organ in case a minute or two of sitting on it should make him explode with excitement. But then, when the week was over... 
Toby Magsman. Mr. Jobs, I bid you farewell. Good Lord. This is your carriage, is it? It is. Fine nags. Very fine. And their jackets, Toby Magsman, are made of silk. And where will these nags in their silk jackets be taking you, Mr. Chops? Pall Mall. I've rented a place there. So, open the carriage door, will you? Hoist me up, please, and put me in. Yep. Yeah. You'll visit me, I hope. Gladly, Mr. Chops. I expect I could do with a friendly face. Going into society, it's been a dream of mine, as you well know. But now that it's coming true, I have to tell you, I'm not a little trepidatious. Mr. Jabba's tale, or rather the showman's tale as recounted by Mr. Jabba, was a while in the telling, and we broke off for refreshment. We were standing near the drawing room window, and Mr. Jabba had raised his glass and wished me very good health, and much else besides that I wish he hadn't wished me, when I glanced at the house over the way. Mr. Jabba? Yes, Sophie Lisper, dear. Look across, if you will, at the house to let. Ah. Uh. Look in particular at the ground floor. Is there by any chance the flickering of a candle? Um. Mr. Jabba was uncertain on this point. He was uncertain, too, whether it would be very wise to venture forth in the evening gloom in order to settle the matter himself. Little did we know that Trottle had already gained entry to the house to let. Well, then, sir. Yes? To business? Business, that's right. Ah. Oh. Fair reward for honest work done, eh? Uh, you watch yourself, sir. Shall have the shirt off your back. Um, <laughs> 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 <coughs> um. You um, you did bring Mr. Fordy's money, did you not? Madam, I shall tell you what I brought, and um, and and you'll be wonderfully surprised. Oh. But first, that noise. The noise. That's right. <sighs> He's at it again, you see. Even in the dark. Is he now? I suppose you want to take a look at him, do you, sir? Well, yes. Certainly. I think I should. And then you'll give us our wonderful surprise. I very much hope to. <gasps> Come then. <laughs> Bring the candle, Benjamin. Uh. You won't have never met the little creature. No. It stands to reason that Mr. Fordy should want you to see him. You're very slow, Benjamin. Slow, yes, that's right. My leg, sir, is stronger than his. Oh. <laughs> I get younger and younger every day and jollier and jollier. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> now then, this is the room. This is where we keep him. Open the door, Benjamin. Uh, uh. Open the door and let our guests take a peep at Mr. Fawley's funny friend. It was the Monday before Christmas and the house to let had not yet yielded up its secret. Though Trottle, my manservant, had taken it upon himself without my knowledge to gain entry to the house. This was on the very same evening that my friend Mr. Jarber was informing me of a conversation he had conducted with a certain Toby Maxman, who some years before had transformed the house into a place of amusements. Among Maxman's attractions, Mr. Jarber learned, was a dwarf by the name of Mr. Chop. And Mr. Chops had won a fortune on the lottery and had left Maxman's employment. So tell me, Mr. Maxman, did Mr. Chops communicate with you at all? Not for some while. But then, out of the blue, I got an invitation to have a drink with him at his lodgings in Pall Mall. So I cleaned myself and I drank with him. Was he alone? No, he was not alone. There was a young fellow there who'd been a swindler at a gaming booth and another who used to play the clarionet at a wild beast show. 
Mr. Chops! Well? The supply of wine is perilously low. Yeah, let more be sent up from your capacious cellar, Mr. Chops, unless we die of thirst. Yeah, and if all I forget... Yes? We shall need a carriage for tomorrow. And a substantial hamper made up of a, a flavoursome comestible. Yeah. And wine, of course. Wine, yes. See to it, Mr. Chops, if you please. See to it. Then he kissed her cold, cold corpus, corpus a thousand, a thousand times off. Oh, he called her his diner, though she was no more. more. <laughs> Do you help? Do Mr. Well. Chops? <laughs> yes, Toby Magsman. Mr. Chops? Even the best of companions must part. So soon. I thank you for the variety of foreign gargle what you have provided so handsome. And now I shall take my leave. Well, if you must, then I shall see you out. Hoist me up, will you? I lifted him up and carried him downstairs. And he smelt so strong and madeiry that he was like a wine jug what had a large and interesting stopper. I ain't happy, Magsman. Are you not? They don't use me well, those two. They puts me on the mantelpiece when I won't have more champagne in. And if I don't give them money, he locks me at the sideboard. <sighs> Get rid of them, Mr. Chops. I can't. Me and them two were in society together. What would society think if I tried to send them away? Time passed. It's a feature of time, I find. One night, after the fat lady of Norfolk had sung a final song and the Indian had scalped his last victim, till tomorrow, that is, I heard a kicking at the front door and to the front door I went. I opened the door, I looked out, but I saw nothing. It's me. I looked down. Mr Chops. Mr Chops. Will you take me back? Take you back? On the old terms. If it's a deal, say done. Done. Good. I thank you for it. Got a bit of supper in the house. Considering what fine fare must have been guzzled at the Pall Mall lodgings, I was ashamed to offer him cold sausage washed down with gin and water, but he seemed happy enough with it. Hmm. Well, Toby Magsman? You see before you one who has gone into society and got out again. And how did you manage the getting out? I got out after paying out to the tune of £12,000, which you may recall is what I won with my lottery ticket. 12000 I paid out, and in return, I've been given a lesson. A valuable lesson. But you can have it for free. Society is all fat ladies. Society is all fat ladies. That's right. You see, your fat lady of Norfolk... She might be considered by some to be an offence upon the eye. How is she, by the way? Very well. Very fat. But them other fat ones, who come and ogle at you and drill holes in your heart and make a colander of it, and who leave you to have your bones picked dry by vultures, like the dead wild ass of the prairies, which is what I deserve to be. Them other fat ones is an offence upon decency and good taste. Magsman, when I was out of society... I was paid just a little in return for being looked at. And when I went into society, I was looked at just the same. And I paid heavy for it. So, the plain fact is, I'm glad to be back. Mm. Good sausage, this. My small friend's observations on the world were not entirely the result of sausagerial influence. It seemed to me that he got... Wiser and wiser every day, and that his head got bigger and bigger as his wisdom expanded. For a while he was kept away from the organ, upon which he had sat in former times, but one evening... Toby Magsman, I should like to be seated upon the organ and to hear some music. Mr Chops, are you sure? I am. Hoist me up. <laughs> yeah. I hoisted him up. And with fear and trembling, lest he find it all too much of an excitement, I began to turn the handle. Well, Mr Chops? Very nice. What are you thinking, Mr Chops? Thoughts. Weighty thoughts. Weighty thoughts, you see, which were a match for his weighty head. And he sat through all the changes 
and then he come off and declared that he'd walk three times round without the saucer and then retire from view, which he did. When I called for him in the morning, I found that he was no longer with us, not in spirit at least. He'd gone into a society much better, I think, than Magsman's amusements. Much better, certainly, than what was offered in Pall Mall. A fine tale, Mr Jarber. Most affecting tale. It is indeed. I should add, by the way, that soon after the funeral of Mr Chops, Toby Magsman decided that his house of amusement seemed so dismal that he must give it up and return to his caravan, which is where I found oh. him. The house is cursed. It's quite clear those who live there are doomed. Good oh. heavens! Who's this? A trottle! Mum, I have solved the mystery of the house to let. How extraordinary! Mr. Jarber here is making the self-same assertion. Mr. Jarber knows nothing, nothing at all. How dare you! Trottle! But I shall tell you what I know, ma'am, if you are willing. Trottle began to describe to us how the occupants of the house to let, an old woman and her inebriated son, had taken him to be an emissary from Mr. Forley, the owner of the house, and as it happens, a cousin of mine. He told of how when the old woman became insistent about the money she expected to be given, he heard a curious scratching noise from a room above and asked that he might see for himself who or what was causing it. Benjamin, uh. give some light so that the gentleman can observe Mr Forley's little friend. Well... Can you see him now? I looked around. The room was empty of all furniture, save for an old bedstead. Over there, sir, under the window. I peered forward, and there, kneeling on the bare boards, with his bright, sharp eyes towards me, was a tiny, wizened boy, no more than five years old. A greasy old shawl was wrapped around him, and on his head was a big cotton nightcap that had dropped down to his very eyebrows. A fine lad, eh? <laughs> What's he been doing? Praying? Oh, praying? Oh, God help us, no! No, he's not been praying. See, he's cleaning the floor. Oh. <laughs> he's pretending to be me. Oh, it's his regular game, morning, noon and night. Crack this dirt! And where's my beer? <laughs> Just listen to him, the little scamp. <laughs> you, you, um, you tell Mr Forley when you next call on him that the boy's going on nicely. You will, won't you, sir? Oh, yeah. Where's my beer? Oh, where's my beer? Has <laughs> he... Has he nothing else to amuse himself with? Some toys, perhaps? Oh, no. No, no, no. This is what he likes to do. I'm a good I am. I work hard and I save candles. That's right. Save candles. That's right. I don't suppose there are many who know about the boy. You're not in the habit of showing him to visitors. Oh, bless you, art alive. Nobody comes to this house. Not now. No, not now. The outside of it warns most folk off. But if anyone is fool enough to inquire about renting it, a hundred and twenty pound, I'll tell them. And that works every time. That sends them scurrying. So Mr Fawley's not interested in the place being let? You could say that, yeah. And we make sure it isn't. <laughs> mm. I'll tell you, sir, what Benjamin and me have done for Mr Forley, one way and another, is quite beyond words. Beyond words, that's right. We left the pitiful little boy and we returned to the dining room. The question of money, I was only too aware, was about to be raised once more. So... There you are, sir. You've met the lad upstairs and you've seen that all is well with him. Mm. And now, the matter of remuneration. That's right. Yes. 
I uh, take it you'd feel somewhat disappointed if I were to tell you that I came to you today without the money. Without, without the money. money? You are disappointed, I can tell. But listen, the situation is that Mr Forley is waiting for the report I'm to give him as to how you're managing with the boy and so on. Once he's received it, found it satisfactory, he'll send me back here with a bigger bit of business by far. Bigger than you could ever imagine. How big? This much? Oh no, madam. You'll need both hands to count it. You will indeed. Oh! Oh, heavens! Oh, sir! Oh, my! Oh! Oh, my! Oh. Thereupon, the old woman grew exceedingly light-headed and began to take great liberties with invoking unearthly beings whose names ought never to have approached her lips. And as quickly as I could... I took my opportunity and bade her and her son farewell and hurried out of the house. Extraordinary. Extraordinary, Mr Jarber. Is this not extraordinary? Not at all, my dear. It merely confirms my own discoveries. The house, as I have told you, is cursed. It is cursed and it is haunted. Border dash! Now, shuttle, it is a house, quite simply, that is owned by a contemptible villain. Namely, ma'am, your cousin, Mr Forley, who for some reason or other has kept a poor child hidden away in it, ignored by the world, unseen... Unseen indeed, except... What do you think, Mr Jarber? Except perhaps for an eye of his, looking out through a hole in the blind? Trottle, the child must be rescued. He must. And his identity must be discovered too, along with the cause of my cousin's despicable action. Mr Jarber, will you assist? No. Sophonisper, I shall not. Oh. Ha! Why should I labour any further when my endeavours thus far have received such scant appreciation? Oh, <laughs> Mr. No, no, Jabba. I withdraw my goodwill. What remains of this sad business? Let it be left to trottle oh. here. <laughs> Adieu! Oh. Adieu! Oh. There were now a few days only before Christmas, but I was not yet in a festive mood. True enough, my manservant Trottle had solved the mystery of the house to let. It was not cursed, as my friend Mr Jarber had claimed it was not haunted. The eye that I had seen peering through a window belonged not to a phantom spirit, but to a small boy who on the instructions of my cousin George Forley was kept imprisoned inside the house away from public view. But now that I knew this much, a sense of helplessness threatened to overcome me. Trottle. Oh, Trottle, what can be done to secure the unfortunate child's release? I've been wondering as much myself. Perhaps I should go to the house and demand custody of him. With respect, ma'am, I'm not quite sure you have the right to do that. But I would look after the boy. I would love him. Yes, ma'am, I'm certain you would. The boy, however, is not yours. True. Let us first discover whose boy he is and why your cousin has chosen to treat him in this fashion. Yes. Uh, remind me, if you will, about Mr Forley's family circumstances. He is a widower? He is. And there were children, were there not? Two daughters, only one of whom survives. She lives in Canada, married, childless. And the other daughter? She had been her father's favourite. But she defied his wishes by marrying a man of low birth whose name was Kirkland. Mr. Forley was so opposed to the match that he vowed he would never forgive her, nor did he. Though, in truth, the couple's marriage was very brief. The husband, a sailor, drowned on his next voyage. And the wife died soon after giving birth to a boy who was stillborn. Well, where was their home? And in a village called... Um, oh, what is the name? Uh, Flatfield. I think near, near Pendlebury. Pendlebury? Yes, is that of any significance? It could be. You may recall, ma'am, that six or seven years ago I took a short holiday and went to Pendlebury to visit some friends of mine? Yes. One of these friends kept a chemist shop, and through him I met a doctor named Barsham. Mm. Uh, he'd been a first-rate practitioner in London, by all accounts, but he was a first-rate fool as well. Began to drink heavily, gambled, lost money, lost custody. This is beginning to sound like one of Mr Jobs' tales. No, no, ma'am. There is sense and meaning to it, I assure you. 
It's connected with my evening visit to the house over the way and my encounter with the old woman and Benjamin, her drunken son. Mm -hmm. It's connected in particular with the ugly subject of Benjamin's face. When I set eyes on that fellow, ma'am, I was almost certain that I had encountered him before. But you think perhaps you had in bed? Correct. The <gasps> drunken Benjamin, I rather suspect, is none other than the foolish Dr. Barsham. <sighs> It is Barsham and his mother who were deputed by your cousin to take care of that hapless, pitiable little child. Take care of, surely, is too generous a phrase. But, Trottle, even if you're right about Barsham, aren't we much the wiser? Well, one thing may lead to another. Mum, I require a day's absence. I must visit Pendlebury again. Trottle! Hey, Trottle! Proctor! <laughs> how very good to see you. I hope so. Though your letter suggested you had business in her. Yeah. I do, Proctor, I do. I want you to tell me a few things about an acquaintance of yours. Benjamin Barsham. Barsham? Oh, Lord. Well, I'm happy to tell you the little I know, but not in <laughs> preference on the station platform. <laughs> Let's get home and have some tea. <laughs> How long ago was it that he left Pendlebury? Four years, five. And his charming mother? She went too? She did. Why did they leave? Was there a particular reason? Well, an unfortunate event had just occurred. The death of a young woman. A Mrs Kirkland, if I'm not mistaken. No, you're not. A child had died at birth and Barsham was the doctor who had attended her. You're certain of that? Quite certain. And his mother was the nurse. This was at a time when Barsham's professional reputation was already as good as destroyed. Who was it who summoned him for the birth? Mrs Kirkland? Oh, her father. Mr George Forley? That's right. He seemed to know a great deal about all this. I'm beginning to feel I know more than I want to. The child's death, that would have been registered by Barsham, I take it? Yes, I suppose so. The poor thing was buried in the local churchyard in his mother's grave. No, Proctor. I don't believe so. Oh, forgive me, but I remember quite distinctly. Proctor, the poor thing was never buried at all. The poor thing still lives. Trottle, your investigative efforts have been quite magnificent. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. I'm almost inclined to agree with you. <laughs> of course, there is as yet no proof. We cannot be certain that you're right about the child. Oh, I can. It's clear to me that Mrs Kirkland's baby survived but that George Forley decided it must be thought to be dead, and Barsham and his mother were employed to carry out the deception. But why should he conceive such a plan? Why, indeed. I wonder, ma'am, do you have a notion as to the arrangements for inheritance in the Forley family? Anything which might have some relevance in this matter? None at all. Well, then, I shall have to see what I can discover myself. I happen to have a friend who does clerical work for a lawyer. Oh. Perhaps with his help, something can be found. Trottle, I am beginning to perceive that you are not only a man of great resourcefulness, but also extremely fortunate in your acquaintances. <laughs> True, I am. <laughs> and may I say, ma'am, that of all my acquaintances, I am most fortunate in knowing you. Oh. Trottle's legal inquiry occupied him for much of the following day, during which time I kept watch over the house to let and rather hoped that I might see an eye looking at me through a hole in the blind, now that I knew who the eye belonged to. But I saw no eye, and I saw no one come or go. Mum! Oh, Trottle! Mum, I bring news. Trottle, I too have news, but you first. What did you find in the probate office? Do sit, Trottle. Documents, Mum. Oh, and more documents, and alas, yet more of them. <sighs> But after considerable searching, the last will and testament of Mr. Forley's father was unearthed, and it contains an interesting particular. The will stipulates that the money left to George Forley may not then be assigned to whomsoever he pleases. Mm. Mr. Forley is granted merely a life interest in the money and has no discretion as to where it should go when he dies. And where is it to go? If either of Mr. Forley's daughters has a son, the money must go to him. Think on that, ma'am. I am doing so. 
The child of the daughter who had defied Mr. Forley and who was the object of his vexation and anger, that child, were he to live, would inherit the family fortune. <gasps> Good reason it might be considered to register that child as stillborn yes. and to shut him away and blot out all trace of his parentage. <sighs> so, ma'am, what now? Do we go to the police? Do you wish to confront your cousin with our discovery? Bring proceedings against him, perhaps? No, Trottle. No, ma'am? That won't be possible. My news is that Mr George Ford is dead. I had been informed by my sister. Forley had died three days before, quite suddenly. Barsham and his mother, Trottle reasoned, were now in a helpless position, and he decided to pay a second call at the house to let in order to obtain from them an admission of the truth. I watched from the window. I saw Trottle crossing the road towards the house, but I saw another man also. The paths of the two men converged at the foot of steps. Oh, oh, forgive me. No, no, my fault. After you. Oh, you're making a visit here, are you? That's right. Do you wish to speak to a certain uh, Benjamin Barsham? I do, as it happens. Uh, and indeed to his mother. Are they known to you? The two men were in conversation for some while, and then I saw Trottle lead the stranger away from the front steps and back across the road. Very soon, I was being introduced to Mr. John Dalcott, confidential legal adviser to the late Mr. Forley, and now his executor. Strange to say, ma'am, it's Mr. Dalcott here who must be thanked for my discovery of the child. Is it now? Last Monday, when I called at the house, Barsham and his mother had assumed that I was Mr. Dalcott and therefore admitted me. Oh, well, it was arranged, you see, that I was to visit them either last Monday or today, bringing money with me for whatever service it was that they'd rendered. On the Monday, other business prevented me from travelling to London. But you're here so... today, despite Mr Forley's death. Uh, well, madam, the money is still owing to Barsham and his mother, and I thought also that as executor I should inform them of Mr Forley's death oh. and advise them that whatever arrangements had previously obtained between themselves and Mr Forley are for the time being discontinued. Nay, for all time, I would hope. Yes, madam. What your manservant has told me of the situation in that house almost beggars belief. Yes. Mm. Uh, Mr. Dorcott, it had been my intention before our chance meeting to speak to Barsham and his mother and encourage them to make some sort of statement as to their part in the whole sorry affair. Oh, a good idea. I shall accompany you, and we shall obtain such a declaration in writing if we can. Well, yeah, and what about the child? The poor creature mustn't stay in that place any longer than necessary. I shall bring him here, ma'am. Shall I? Well, what do you say, Mr. Dorcott? Will it be in order for me? To look after the boy in the short term, I mean, at least. Mr. Dolcott agreed, and he and Trottle, it was late evening now, returned to the house over the way. They obtained the written declaration, and Trottle removed the boy from his wretched room and carried him out of the house. The boy was brought to me, and though he held away at first, it was not long before he clung close. A bed was made up for the little mite, and he was washed, and a shirt of trottles was used as a nightgown, and he was soon fast asleep. He looks contented enough, does he not, ma'am? He does. Trottle? Yes, ma'am? God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. It occurs to me, Trottle, that I ought to have asked Mr. Dolcott about what will happen to the house to let now that my cousin has died. I should imagine, ma'am, that it will be put up for sale. If it is, I'd like to buy the place. If I succeed, I shall make some changes to it. I hope you will. I shall transform it entirely. I shall turn it into a hospital. A hospital, ma'am? A hospital for sick children. That's my plan. What do you say, Trottle? I say, God bless you. <laughs> The following day, it being Christmas Eve, I sent Trottle round to my friend Mr. Jarper, he who had attempted, but failed, to solve the mystery of the house to lead. But Mr. Jarber, it transpired, was unable to accept my invitation to come over for refreshments. He was suffering from a fever. 
as a consequence of which he had become somewhat distracted in his mind about various strange occurrences, including a sailor return from the dead and a dwarf return from society. So instead of entertaining Mr. Jobber, I devoted the time to my little boy, the dear child whom I have since adopted, and who is the beloved and loving answer to my prayers. I sat with him and I played with him, and I thought about the misery from which he had been rescued. I thought, too, about another child, who is never thought about enough at Christmas time. And I humbly gave thanks to God for all his blessings. In A House to Let by Charles Dickens, Wilkie Collins, Elizabeth Gaskell and Adelaide Proctor. Sophonisba was played by Marsha Warren, Mr Jarber by Alec McCowan, Trottle by Brian Croucher, Openshaw by Sam Dale, Alice by Miranda Keeling, Nora by Tracy Wiles, Mr Chops by Warwick Davis and Frank by Stephen Critchlow. You also heard Bethan Walker, Sycat Ahmed, Marlene Sidaway, Mark Straker, Paul Biggin and Alex Miller. It was dramatised by Martin Wade and directed by Ned Shire. And next time we find Vera and Irene stuffing homemade turkey sausages, adding hot pepper to the mulled wine and giving each other totally unsuitable Christmas presents. And Reed and Prunella Scale star as the ladies of letters. Go crackers. Christmas on BBC Radio 4 Extra. The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Sir. Yes? Merry Christmas, sir. Mm -hmm. What is this? Your Christmas present, sir. Hmm. A lump of clay and a cabbage. Yes, sir. It's a charm to eliminate chaos from your life. I've adapted it from one my great aunt used back in England. You take the cabbage and you... You... Which spell did you use? Sir? With the broom, which spell? Well... I didn't really get very far. I said Fliege, Fliege, Mim Basin, but it didn't work. In order to animate a broom, you Anglo Saxon halfwit, you must summon the spirit of the tree from which it is made. The process is clearly explained in Volume 1, Chapter 9 of a book I have asked you many times to read. It is highly advanced magic, far beyond your primitive capabilities. Well, you appear to have done no actual harm. Let us be thankful for that. Yes, sir. You will have done something, though, if you attempted to use the seal. I wonder what it was. Fourteen stone. Stay here and mind the shop, Peter. Stay here? Oh, oh thank you, sir. Hand me my cloak. You will behave impeccably. Is that understood? This is your last chance. If on my return I find a frog's toe out of place, I will throw you into the river. My wand of Arbor Vitae, quickly. Yes, sir. You will look after Frida and see she has all she wants. Yes, sir. Where is she, by the way? Frida? Liebchen? I'm up the chimney, Papa. Up the chimney? What is she doing there? Go and see. I'm late. Oh, my crystal ball. Impeccably, you hear? As you had the broom out, you may as well sweep the floor. I shall be back at midnight. Change the setting of the clock. Yes, sir. And feed Copernicus. And feed Copernicus. Change the clock. Sweep the floor. Boil your head. You dried up old prune. What's wrong with my pyjamas anyway? Hello, Puss. No chance of going to the Strokop annual Christmas frenzy, then. Look after Frida. Of all the ways to spend Christmas Eve. I'm up the chimney, Papa. Little girls are a pain. Oi, Copernicus. I'd appreciate you not wiping your nose on my leg. I suppose you want feeding. 
That's all you do, eat and sleep. And you must be the most useless cat in the universe. I know. What can we palm off on you for supper today? That should be good for a laugh. <coughs> what have we got? Um, I'd offer you some newt's eyes, but we're out. A fillet of fenny snake, a howlet's wing, shark's gizzard, or we've got some baboon's blood. Only four groats a bottle. Just herrings, as usual, please. S sorry? Herrings. And make sure the bowl's clean. Herrings? Pickled for my supper, and a bit less of the abuse poetry. My ancestors were learning the Torah while yours were running about in bearskins, so a little respect wouldn't go amiss. You spoke. You can talk. Is that so bad? You never spoke before. I'm a cat. You want I should sing, too? But why are you talking now? You're asking me. You're the one who used the Seal of Solomon. Oh, gosh. You mean... That well, that's amazing. I had no idea. That seal must be really powerful. The Hexenmeister said I would have done something, but he didn't know what. That's Lemire. He knows nothing. He's a quack. Some dreck in fancy glass bottles and a speaking clock. This he calls magic. Uh, him I don't talk to. Oh, crumbs. Are you saying he's no good? In my family, to be a magus meant something. Moses, Solomon, they were great men. They knew their craft. Moses and Solomon? Wow. High warlock for the conjuration of wizards he wants to be. <laughs> it's a miracle he's on the committee. 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 He's on the committee.